So Ford and Rockefeller fought tooth and nail over what should be the nation's fuel supply until Rockefeller decided not to play fair anymore. So what he did was rather diabolical. He funded a little group of, of whacked out old ladies called the Women's Christian Temperance Movement. These people have been around since the late 1800s, a championing against demon rum. And so what Rockefeller did is he gave this group $4 million to go ahead and lobby Congress to get alcohol outlawed. And uh, to just kind of put that in a modern context, that would be like giving Jerry Falwell $400 million nowadays to lobby Congress. And you can buy Congress for that. That's, that's pretty understandable. So they did it, they, and they passed a law called Prohibition, which you've all read about or heard about, and you thought it probably had something to do with drinking and moral decay of the United States. So can you imagine an all-male Congress voting to prevent working men from drinking, okay, as, as like a natural consequence of any kind of political discussion? I don't think so. But for $4 million, it was no problem. And so for 13 years, alcohol went off the market as a fuel, as an industrial product, which used to compete with many oil products, and of course, uh, for drinking also. So alcohol is, has a long history, starting back during Prohibition, of fighting tooth and nail with the oil companies for what we should have as our national fuel supply. In other countries, it wasn't even an issue because oil tankers didn't exist until in, in, in large quantities until after World War II. So places like the Philippines and New Zealand ran their entire economies on alcohol, as did Brazil. They used nipa palm trees, which have these great big globes that produce like three quarts of sugar solution a day, which they would tap like maple sugar, sugar trees all into big tanks and ferment it and make alcohol. New Zealand used beets and other kinds of uh, sugar crops. Um, probably the biggest uh, in the early part of the century before World War II, that biggest, most organized alcohol economy was Germany. Germany had a huge cooperative alcohol fuel system where farmers would bring their potatoes in, they would get back one third of the alcohol, the distillery would keep two thirds, and the farmer would get back all the mash, the leftover pulp after making the alcohol, which they would then feed to their pigs. You know, and so they got their animal feed back and they got a third of the alcohol which they could sell or use in their farm, and then you know, the cooperative distillery would sell the other two thirds. This was so effective that when it came to World War II and immediately the Allies cut off Germany from having oil, didn't stop them for a minute. You know, they just continued their war effort, first running on alcohol and then later uh, developing other synthetic fuels, but alcohol was really what kept World War II going for Germany. Same as was in Japan. Those zeros that flew over to our country couldn't make it on gasoline. Not enough uh, ability to climb, not enough you know, distance. They had to run them on alcohol. Um, we ran our torpedoes on alcohol during World War II because alcohol is tolerant of water, et cetera. So there's a long history of this stuff being used all over the world. And it only really changed after World War II. Now, you know, the, the importance of the Middle East to the oil supply was understood all during this period, this early period before World War II. Um, this is a great quote that I found in an uh, economic journal from England at the, uh, during that period. America is running through her stores of domestic oil and is obliged to look abroad for future reserves, which are very largely in British hands or are controlled by British capital, which refers to the Middle East, because the Middle East used to be under the British Empire. Before very long, America will have to come to us for the petroleum she needs. It will be within the limits of the commanding position that the future has in store for us to hold up the entire world to ransom in the distribution and price of this vital essential. So, you know, all the hand-wringing nowadays about, oh my God, we're, we're suddenly dependent on the Middle East, we've understood this, this was gonna happen since the 20s. And there's been certain reprieves over time as big reserves were found, but basically everyone has always known that the Mid Middle East is where most of the oil is, even in 1919. So, so we're talking about a really ongoing battle between um, farmers and basically large you know, a handful of large corporations controlling um, the fuel supply in this country. And over and over again, we find uh, throughout the history of fuel in this country, incredible, sophisticated propaganda campaigns to keep alcohol off the map and basically manipulate public opinion. Um, you know, and probably if I asked, and I will ask right now, 
what are some of the things you've heard about alcohol fuel? And we can list some of those myths right now. I can probably tell you where they all came from. Well, um, if we use ethanol, then we're going to be using up our topsoil um, to grow corn so that we can grow our cars. So. Okay, so it's, it uses up or damages our soil, um, which is theoretically unethical to take, you know, our, our valuable soil and turn it into fuel. What else have we heard? Um, corrodes aluminum, ethanol corrodes. Corrodes metals, and also in that myth is also rubber and all kinds of car parts are supposedly damaged by alcohol. Any other myths? I don't know, myth, but I, I consider myself fairly well educated, and yet, you know, all of what you're saying is pretty new to me. And so, I guess I grew up thinking that there was no alternative. So, talk about brainwashing. I mean, is there something that happened in the educational system? Well, it's nothing that doesn't happen normally under capitalism. It's just, it's just you're getting woke up to this particular hydra head of it. What about that? Is it possible that, it, and the, that there is a uh, long term? Uh, Economic downside to alcohol? Is it economically sustainable? And of course, that's, you know, that you've heard this re actually in the last uh, few weeks in the debate of the energy bill in the Senate. They basically say that alcohol is completely unsustainable economically. It's only a way to make Midwest farmers rich at the uh, expense of American taxpayers subsidizing alcohol fuel. Otherwise, it couldn't survive in the market. We'll talk about that. What about all the people who are going to drink it? <laughs> Boy, you know, you know, I've got a cartoon in here. Alcohol station, and they're going to. Boy, that's a great one. You know, back during, back right after the prohibition, and alcohol was back out again, the old companies were enforced the program. They had these great photos, or I should say, great cartoons, political cartoons that said every gas station would be a speakeasy. You know, of course, alcohol is, I'll explain why that doesn't uh, a case, why it doesn't happen. There's actually the biggest myth with nobody's mentioned yet, and you'll all, you'll all say, oh, I've heard this as soon as I say it, which is that using alcohol actually uses more oil because it takes more petroleum to produce alcohol than you get back in the alcohol. All the energy of farming, all the energy of transportation, all that stuff actually uses more energy than you get out. This is a huge, hugely promoted myth, the energy balance question. So we're going to, we'll definitely debunk these and explain how this is, what's going on with these because they come up even today. For instance, this one here, we haven't heard about the corrosion issue in the United States for a long time because we debunked those back in the 80s, but now it's like no one's ever said it in Australia. They're talking about how alcohol will wreck the cars, just like it was 1980 in the United States. Well, um, just in, if you don't address conservation, it seems like um, the, the sustainability of anything we do is really a question because we just can't, we can't replace oil wells with monoculture, corn or whatever it is because we consume too much. I'm in total agreement with you and we'll, we'll address that. And there's no doubt that, I mean, there's no disputing that we have to use less energy, period. You know, that's, that's absolutely true. So part of that, part of the question you're asking is, can this produce enough energy in a way that doesn't cause ecological, negative ecological consequences? We'll cover that. You know, I thought part of conversion was uh, having to go to stainless steel, though, you know, because of the corrosion issue. Well, let me launch into it and we'll start catching up on these detailed questions.